Sakula, come on up. I've asked him if he would bless us with a word today, and he has agreed to it. So, share it. So, those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Steve Rockle, as Pastor Allen said. And if you see me around the church, I'm usually in the sound booth or doing some of the technical and communication stuff. But actually, the last... I always started here back in, I think, January and February, but before that, I served as associate pastor with Pastor Al up in Cocado, and uh, he did a great job of teaching me how to become a servant leader, and I've used those in, in uh, all areas of my life, including um, work relationships and relationships here at church, relationships at school, just anywhere I can be. I just want the best of my abilities to become more of a servant leader like Jesus, and a few weeks ago, I was reading through 2 Samuel in chapter 11, and many people know the story of David and Bathsheba, and that itself is a whole sermon how David was led into sin and adultery and, and going down that path and how that one sin changed David's history, his family genealogy for years and generations and all that generational curse stuff. But... When I was reading this story, and it's funny how you can read the same story over and over and over again, but this one person in that story stood out to me, and his name was Uriah. So, just a bit of a backstory on King David. He was the second king in Israel's history after Saul. He was the one that killed Goliath when he was just a young teenager. He spent many, wilderness, many years in the wilderness hiding from Saul. Because Saul was very jealous about his, his popularity. David had been, his, was after Goliath, he was like, he was a superhero to the Israelites since he was an early teenager. And so that popularity of his just skyrocketed ever since, and that made uh, Saul very, very jealous. And so, um, but bef and David is also the general, the lead of Saul's army. Um, and this whole time, David continued to honor Saul, regardless of how many times that Saul tried to kill him. David always honored that person that God had placed in, in, ahead of him. Again, that's a whole nother sermon, but I don't want to go there. I just want to lay the foundation of David and his popularity. I mean, nowadays, everybody goes and watches the Marvel Avenger movies. And David had this group of mighty warriors with him called the Mighty Men. David's 30 the, the mighty men, there was 30 of them, and in reality there was 37, but they called them the 30. And these guys were literally the Avengers of the Old Testament. You had uh, Joseph, who wielded a spear against 800 and killed them all at one time. With just a spear, he killed 800 enemies. Eleazar rose down and struck a Philistine until his hands were weary and clung to his sword. Anybody ever, like, worked all day in the field and your hands are so... Hi, it's hard to unclench them. This guy fought so long that they had to pry the sword from his hand. These are just a few. I'm not going to go through all 30. The other one, he stood, he stood against the midst of the plot and, and refused to leave and defended it against the Philistines. And this whole time, it says that even though they accomplished these great many things, but the Lord was with them the whole time. And these, these soldiers, these 30 men, were so loyal to David that David was just, he was just thinking out loud. And he says, he's, he's just sitting there, he's like, man, this is at the time the Philistines were holding Jerusalem. And David has, he, he loved the water from the well in the middle of the city. And he was just sitting there, he's like, man, if only I could get just a drink of water from them. So a group of his mighty warriors, they broke, they, 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 they fought through the front lines, they broke into the city, got him a drink of water, and he comes out, and David's just like, I can't, he's, he felt like, you guys served, you like, you sacrificed your life just so I can have a drink of this water, and he felt too, at this time, David's convictions were high enough where he said, I can't drink this, and so he poured it out on the ground as, as an honor to those that he, that uh, sacrificed their lives for him, and this is early in David's career, and we fast forward until uh, he was about 
probably in his, they say was in his like 40, 45-ish. And he, he was sitting, this is the part of the story that everybody knows. He was sitting on his roof on his couch while everybody else is off to fight. And this is another message that we could go down about how, you know, if we're not doing the things that we're called to do, or for most men's sake, if you're bored, sitting at home doing nothing on the couch watching TV, that's often lead into temptation and sin. And that's what happened to Saul or uh, David at this point. He saw a pretty woman bathing on a roof, and he went, he went to uh, figure out who it was and ended up being Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And Uriah is listed under David's mighty men. So Uriah was one of his top warriors. If, so if, uh, if David was Captain America, <laughs> Uriah would have been like the Falcon or somebody like that, one of his sidekicks, but was like so loyal to David. And David is like, oh, this is, not only was Bathsheba Uriah's wife, but Bathsheba's father is also listed as one of the mighty men. So this, this woman is growing up in, in not only just the, uh, amongst military men and all this stuff, so she knows how things go. So when David invited her over to, you know, to sleep with her and to have a sin, because at first when I read this, I'm like, why would a woman do that? But she knows how that military system worked, and she couldn't say no at that time. So time goes by, and uh, is, we know that part of the story where, you know, she gets pregnant, and we're going to read from 2 Samuel chapter 11, or 2 Samuel chapter 11. Um, in the spring of that year, in the time of the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab his servant with him and all of Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged uh, Rabbah. And here's, here's uh, when somebody besieges a city, they surround it. And at that point, they can, uh, if you surround the city, this, you cut off the supply line, you cut off the life of the city. And it happened in one late afternoon. In one late afternoon, David rose from his couch, walked on the roof, and he saw a woman bathing. And this is where that whole thing started. Most men, I mean, that's where that temptation would stop. I mean, the sin isn't that you accidentally see it, but the sin is if you look, keep looking, and you keep letting that thing fester in your mind. But again, we're not talking about that story. We're getting to the story I want to talk about. So David sent word to Joab, send me, he, fig he figures out that Uriah is, is uh, oh, sorry, I actually fast forward a bit there. He f see, he sleeps with, with Bathsheba, and he figures out that Uriah is, is uh, her husband. So he sends for Uriah, and, and Uriah comes up. And most, actually most, most people wouldn't. Most, most people, they lie begets lie begets lie, right? Everything, you get, cover yourself up and you dig a deeper hole. So why would David invite Uriah over to his house after he impregnated his wife? You know, you would think like, oh, hey, he would confess because that's where the, it should have stopped, is right there, that confession. I'm sure, yeah, hearts would have been broken. Things would have been messed up for a while, but over time, heal some things. I remember growing up, my parents always said, you know, if you do something stupid, come and confess it right away. And uh, so I was playing baseball in my living room with my brother. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'm like, I want to hit it as far as I can. So I hit it, and it broke some lights. And right away, I'm like, I remember here, my mom, I'm like, I don't want to get in trouble for this. So I went and told her right away. And she's like, oh, that's fine, you know, whatever. But then quite a few other times, you get into your teenage years where, you know, you start with a little white lie. And that lie is like, well, I'm lying now. I might as well just keep into it. And uh, I'm not going to go into it, but that's kind of what happened with my first marriage as well, is that one lie, get another lie, another lie. And at one point, I'm like, well, I can't tell the truth now. But that's how most people, and that's what happened with David. So David, instead of confessing to Uriah, says, and at this point, Uriah was on the front lines fighting with all the other 30 men, all the other warriors. And David's like, hey, why don't you go, you, you, you fought, you earned it. Why don't you go and spend some, some time with your wife? And Uriah, uh, he's like, well, why, why? Why would I enjoy the comforts of my home? When all my brothers, all my friends, all the other warriors are on the front lines giving their lives for this, why should I get this blessing? 
So at this point, David's convic- or, uh, Uriah's conviction was on par with David's back in the time when uh, David had that same mentality. Why should I enjoy the comforts of this stuff when all my friends are dying? But that was, that was plan A. Plan A is convince Uriah he deserves to be with his family. It says, uh, go clean yourself and then go see your wife. David is trying to cover up this sin now by saying, so he thinks that if, if Uriah can go home and spend time with his family, then uh, they'll believe that that child is Uriah's and that David wouldn't have to, uh, he wouldn't have to deal with his sin anymore. But this is obviously not what happened. Uriah is, his convictions were too high. He, he held too high to his values. And David at this point is probably only getting more, not just frustrated, angry, but embarrassed. He's like, I can't have one of my men show me up as far as my manliness. So his uh, plan B, get him drunk, lower his convictions, and send him home. But again, Uriah, you know, he, they do. They have a party to throw an honor, and Uriah, again, doesn't go home. Instead, he sleeps at the gate with all the other servants. And this right here is a startling contrast to where David is. And to where Uriah is, Uriah drunk has more honor and conviction than David does sober. And I know most men are very, very competitive. You know, they always have this contest. I mean, my brother's even growing up. Who could fart the loudest? You know, who could burp the loudest? Who could punch better and all this kind of stuff? So when somebody starts to show you up in manliness... It's not right, and that's probably only made David more and more angry and upset. And David's reputation at the time was also now in check because everybody held him to such high standards. And actually, years before this, when, when uh, Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, they, one of the laws in there that they didn't even want to have adultery a foothold in the culture. So if a, people were caught in adultery, you know what the punishment for that was? It was death. So David at this point is probably very, very, very much concerned about his, his reputation, about what man thinks of him. And the, when I was reading through the story, especially on the, on the side of Uriah from his point of view, I always grew up thinking David was one of those people in the Bible that nobody could measure up to. Like years, um, years about six or seven years ago, my brother, my oldest brother, gave me a book called *The Measure of a Man* by Gene Getz. Has anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, it's a good book. And in that book, in the very second chapter, it lists 20 points in Scripture in Timothy and Titus. What Paul talks about is a measure of a man. the The context of the book was about about that, but actually the con. What Paul is writing about is the measure of a leader. And when I read this, I got through two points of the 20. And I'm like, I can never measure up to this. It's impossible. Because at that point, I thought I was who I was, and I couldn't change myself. So I closed the book. I kind of threw it over my shoulder. And then a couple years after that, when I was going through divorce, and actually that same brother that gave that book to me had passed away, I found that book again. I opened it up, and I read those 20 points. And God used that to show me how much he had changed my heart. And so when David now is questioning his manliness and his reputation on what people think of him, he starts getting more and more and more frustrated, concerned. And uh, so what he does is plan, plan A was convince Uriah that he deserves time with his family. Plan B is get him drunk send him home. None of those work, so plan C is to kill him and steal his wife. So David signs a note to Joab, who is the general, and says, in the note he puts, you know, send Uriah to the front. They're already besieging the city, right? In in this scene, they already surrounded the city, and all they had to do right now is wait. Nobody had to die. They just had to wait until that city surrendered. I mean, David's army already had the supply lines. The, The city didn't. So David writes in this note to Joab, send Uriah to the front, to the gate where the arrows can get to him. Because on the top of the walls, that's where all their archers were, and they just shoot down. 
said, send a group of people up there to attack and then have them retreat, but leave Uriah there. And so David, he writes the note, stamps it with the seal of the king, and uh, he calls Uriah back. He says, here, give this to Joab. So Uriah is holding his own death sentence, and he brings that. He didn't know that because you, you can't break the seal unless it's for that intended audience. So he brings it to, to, uh, to Joab, and Joab reads it. He sends it to the front line, and then at this point, Uriah is killed. Now, David thinks, you know, and after a time of mourning, you, uh, he has Bathsheba over and, and he marries, him, marries her quickly so that, you know, this baby now will, everybody will think is his. So he thinks his sin is all covered up. But we know the end of that story is how Nathan instead came out and called him out on it and said, because of this, there's going to be bloodshed in your household there's going to, this son will die, but the next son is actually Solomon, who grew up in the, in the, who was able to build a temple. But David, David gave Uriah his own death sentence and handed it to him. Now, and I wanted, I wanted to bring this up as, as Uriah's conviction. At one point, David had that same level of honor, respect, and integrity in his life. And it's something that I myself try to hold to. I mean, I'm not perfect by any means. You know, I try my hardest to, you know, to serve my wife. But I know I fail in that many areas. And this is Father's Day. And though I'm not a father yet, I still want to be the best person, the best husband I can now. So that I already have those, those character traits that when God does bless me with children. But... Just like David and his convictions fell because he got comfortable and he got complacent with things in a life that happens way too often in our culture today, in Western society. And when I was actually, when I was writing these notes and putting them in, I was reading all these statistics, what I'll share with you quickly. I'm like, why would I put these in here? Because they don't really make men look very good, especially on Father's Day. When you take in consideration that in back in 1960, there were fewer than six or uh, 300,000 households held by a single father. So that 300,000 households in 1960 were, uh, were by a single father. And uh, if you look today, that number has jumped to more than 2.6 million. Today, I, I, miss, I was talking to some friends the other day, and I said that 20% of households were from single, single parent households were from single fathers. But that statistic was actually off. It's 8% were from single fathers. So that means 92% of single households are from single women. women. You know, my sister is one of them. She has, she's a single mother of a 10 year old son. And actually, last weekend we we're on vacation, and he doesn't have very many, you know, good role models in his life. So. I'm like, hey, what if he just comes and spends a week at our house so Beck and I can hang out with him? And every time I go over to my sister's house and she needs done, work done around the house, like mowing the lawn and stuff, I take him with. You know, he sits on the lawn tractor with me. And I, I'm doing my best to showcase what a, a true man of God is. But at the same time, I'm not perfect myself. And I always try to make sure I implant that in his head that we can do our best, but we don't have to be perfect. And when I think about having my own kids, it terrifies me, <laughs> right? Because when, when we're singing the song, Good, Good Father, right, I've talked to so many people about how we view God as often how we view our parents. And so for me growing up, you know, my parent, I was fortunate enough to have both my parents my entire life. In fact, they're both still alive and they're both married. You know, my dad is, I don't know how old they are, but... <laughs> They've been married for over, uh, I want to say, 40 years, and they're still together, and they're, I can see every time I go visit them, their relationship grows. You know, so I am fortunate enough to have that role model in my life, whereas I know many, many, many of my friends don't have that. So when we view God, we often, it's subconscious in how we view, we view God in how we, the same way we view our parents. So if a household, 92% of single households, grow up without a father. And if now we come to church and we're singing good, good father, 
it's really, really hard for those people to comprehend that. But in essence, God is a good father. He is, and he is our role model for life. So um, in our culture today, women are more likely to graduate high school, graduate college, get a degree, move out of their parents' household, and become successful. That's nothing against men, and it's nothing, I'm not trying to say that, nothing against women either. In fact, for many, many years, women were oppressed in Western society. And it's so cool to see women step up and become successful, whereas men are more likely to not even finish high school. They're, they're more likely to not go to college, and if they go, go to college, they're not likely to finish. Instead, they end up moving back in with their parents and staying there till they're 40 and 50 and to buy all these toys. I remember years ago um, at church here, we studied the resolution. And one of the most, to me, the, one of the lines that stood out the most in that, part, in that book was, too many men want the rewards, freedoms, privileges of manhood, but only the responsibilities of boyhood. You know, I fall into that category myself. I'm, I'm obsessive by nature. So I, I focus on one thing until I get that. So the last few years, it's been a motorcycle. <laughs> so I obsess. I research and I study all the different types of motorcycles out there, and I find the ones that I like that you know fit my lifestyle or they fit the type of riding I want to do. But all I got were these little hand-me-downs from my brother that he spent 500 bucks on. This is 86 Kawasaki ZL600. And I fixed it up and I drove it, but I spent more time working on it than I did drive it. So that obsession wasn't cured. But knowing my personality, as soon as I were to get an actual working motorcycle, it's like, oh, I don't want this anymore. And I move on to the next obsession. And that's just by nature, that's who I am. And actually, I think a lot of men are like that. Then you go from toy to toy to toy to toy. And uh, so I, I just turned, another thing, I just turned 30 this year. And a year ago when I turned 29 is when I actually had a minor meltdown. I'm like, man, I don't have an excuse to, you know, goof off anymore. I actually have to grow up. But, you know, because there's that point in scripture where Paul says, you know, when I was a boy, I thought of a boy. And now a man, I think, is a man. And so many men, I'm sorry, guys, I'm to tell you on Father's Day, but we suck. We suck at holding to our responsibilities. We suck at holding to our convictions. To look at people like David, I mean, I idolized David, I idolized Solomon when I was a kid. I'm like, I'm never going to measure up to these guys. And then when I read stories like this, it reminds me David's still a human. Solomon, even though Solomon was ordained to build God's temple, he had 600 wives and 300 concubines. And, you know, he, he had a, that adulterous heart as well. And I'm not trying to give all these statistics and to, to say that, as men that we suck. Instead, because in all honesty, human, by human nature, we can't hold up to God's standards. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, it wasn't, first of all, those Ten Commandments weren't for law to rule and reign over us. It's because God saw before that how much we sucked. So he said, you know what, if you follow these, you're going to suck a little less. You know? <laughs> But he, these standards are so high that nobody could fulfill them. So God gave us Ten Commandments. Moses turned that into 600 laws. And over time, they dwindled down, and Jesus brought them down to two. Two things that we can do is love God and love others. But even that, but at the same time, Jesus made it simpler. He made it more, like, harder to fulfill. And the Ten Commandments says if you... You know, if you murder somebody, it's a sin. But Jesus says if you hate your brother, that's murder in your heart. The Ten Commandments says if you commit adultery, that's sin. But Jesus says if you even look at somebody lustfully, that's adultery. So even more, those standards are so high that we cannot reach them. But the beauty of grace and the beauty of mercy and what what Christ's death was for is so that we we don't have to be perfect one of the, one, actually, how I came to be at Riverside, I was going through divorce, and I was speaking with Nancy Block, and I told her, I remember in her office, I'm like, you know, I call myself a Christian, because I grew up Christian in a Christian household, 
But I, my heart was always, I'll follow you after high school, God. I want to do my own thing now. But after high school, I got to drinking and partying and smoking and all this other stuff. And I remember telling Nancy, like, I call myself a Christian, but I do all this stuff that people say I shouldn't. And at the time, I didn't want to change. I'm like, why should I have to change? I mean, I'm fine with who I was, even though I was miserable at the time. But that's just how our, our brains convince ourselves, just like David convinced himself that him, his sin was okay as long as he could cover it up. But one thing Nancy told me that's, that's still stuck with me today is that God doesn't care about our sin. He wants our heart. So, and it's not as in like, all right, I got a license to sin. I can do whatever I want now. It's the fact that my focus is in doing good. My focus is in like, oh, I have to be perfect. I got to go to church on Sunday. I got to read my Bible. I got to pray every night. I got to, there's a whole list of do's and don'ts. And if you do those, you can be a Christian. If you can follow the Ten Commandments, you can be a Christian. But in all reality, just like that book my brother gave me, I'm like, these standards are too high. I cannot reach. I'm not a man, and I thought I wasn't a man. I'm like, well, I, there's poor me kind of attitude. But in reality, when I took my focus off not doing this or not doing this and instead doing this or that, over time, God brings, brought me back to these moments where he's like, he himself is changing my heart. He himself is making me become the man he wants me to be. So before, before this moment, another thing is I, I knew that to hate somebody is murder, right? Because that's what the Bible tells us. But at that time, I had all this head knowledge. And I hated my ex-wife's parents because I blamed them for my situation. And I remember the moment that I was thinking that, and six months later, I remember just driving in my car because I was... I was really stressed, and I drove up to their house, and it's like I didn't even have control as I was doing. I just drove up to their house, and knocked on their door, and I asked forgiveness for how I treated their daughter. And when I drove away, it's like God, God told me, he's like, look at how I'm changing your heart. The same thing when I quit smoking. I had given up trying to quit. Anybody who's ever tried to quit smoking knows what it's like. I'm, like, I'm just going to smoke till I die. I don't care anymore. But at that point, I stopped focusing on what I was doing right and wrong, and I put my heart on Jesus instead. And two, two weeks later, I was done. I, I, didn't, I didn't, like, even, it's two weeks after I was done smoking is when my brother passed away. And that was the no, I knew at that moment I never would smoke again because everybody was smoking. And the most stressful point, in the most stressful time of my life, and the last thought I had in my head was I need a cigarette. So the point is, like with all this stuff, all these statistics to show that men in our culture are not doing what they're told to be doing, and even as Arnold, you said in the beginning, how important fatherhood is to children. Like uh, one of the bo one, a book I read when I was going through divorce, I, st I studied scripture on marriage, I studied books on it, I listened to sermons and podcasts, and this one guy said that uh, it's not wrong to show um, affection in front of your children because as fathers we lead that example on how to treat a woman to our to our sons and on the on our daughter's side it shows what a true man looks like and honestly when I said earlier I'm scared to have kids I'm scared to death to have a little daughter as much as I want a daddy's girl as much as I want that I'm afraid that no guy is ever going to be good enough, which, which uh, is Jerry in here. <laughs> you know, I'm so thankful that they saw, they, they saw the new me and not the old me. And even then, you know, even then it was, you know, I had, to, I had to prove to them, not because they didn't trust me, but because I know how important their daughter was to them. And I wanted to show that I wasn't just some other guy off the street and that I actually, I actually want to take care of her. I want to, I want to be that husband for her. And uh, if any of you were here at Lisa's funeral and Dale was speaking, it's like he took words out of my mouth. I was trying to put myself in his spot. And he said that he was so thankful that he got to be the one to be her husband. You know, in, in our culture, I remember 
like in our culture, men were taught that they're the rulers of the household, as in, you know, iron fist, we're the gavel, we have the final authority. But just like God gave us the Ten Commandments to love and honor us, that's what our jobs are as husbands and fathers. Yeah, we're responsible for our household. Like when in the garden, when Eve was the one that sinned, it was Adam that God held accountable for that. Because in a covenant, there is a responsible party. And there's, so if you put too much thought of it, what I often do when I obsess of things, I spend way too much time in my head, there is way too much, there's way too much responsibility in fatherhood and manhood. But at the same time, we don't have to do it alone. We have Christ. And a lot of these statistics come from non-Christian households, but it doesn't mean because you call yourself a Christian that you're held, that, you know, you're better, or that you can do it. I know how hard it is to, to be a husband. I don't know how hard it is to be a father yet, but I can only imagine that the responsibility that you have to raising a child to become a proper human being and not to mess them up. But we don't have to try the point, of, the point of life, the point of being a Christian is that we just give our lives to Christ and that everything we do, we don't, have to, we don't have to worry anymore. We don't have to be in fear. We don't have to have anxiety. One of my favorite verses is do not worry about these things, but tomorrow has enough problems of its own. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and these shall be given to you. So that means... For me, I'm, I'm fearful of being a father. But you know what? I don't have to fear that because God is going to be with me. I was scared to be a proper husband because, you know what? I've messed up before. And the whole time that Beck and I were dating, I kept trying to make excuses in my head. But God kept shutting those down. And because I'm like, you know, I, I have to find myself first. And in our reality, I already knew who I was. But the point of it, I had to fully trust in him to lead me so therefore I can properly lead my family. And the point of this, the, to all the fathers and husbands in the room, is you don't have to be perfect. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will take care of the rest. Yeah. Lord, we thank you so much for you being who you are, so that we can just turn to you, and not just in our time of need, but in our time of want as well, God, that you are always with us, <laughs> that you will never leave our side, you will never forsake us, Lord. And sometimes we, we pick up the mantle and we try to do things our own way, and we try to take care of things our own way, and we try to provide for our way. And, but every time I know myself, I mess up, but God, you're always there for me. You're always there for us. And you're a God that we can come to and that we can have a personal relationship with. And you're a God that we can, that we can communicate with and that we don't have to be perfect, that you take us exactly as we are and that you change us from the inside, God, that we don't have to focus on being right, we don't have to focus on being wrong, but instead we can put our focus and I trust in you, Father, then you will take care of us and you will provide for us. And Lord, as we go about our day today, and as today that we respect and that we, we honor fathers and that important role as, as it is, Lord, I ask that you, that you continue to give those fathers not just the strength, but the wisdom, the knowledge, and the courage, Lord, not just to be good husbands, but to be good fathers. And that we know we don't have to try to be perfect. Because we're, when we are weak, you are strong, God. Lord, we just give everything to you. You are our provider, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>